Nixon became the first U.S. president to visit communist China. And we're still feeling the effects today. John Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. This week marks the 50th anniversary of President Richard Nixon's groundbreaking trip to China on February 21st, 1972. It paved the way for one day normalizing trade relations between the U.S. and China and getting China in the World Trade Organization. Given that you can buy American flag underwear from Walmart that's made in China, I'd say that mission was successful. But ultimately, that trip also paved the way for all the security challenges the U.S. faces with China today. And I'm not just talking about how some of these underwear aren't very, ahem, <clears throat> secure. When Nixon went to China, tensions between the U.S. and Communist China were high. Chinese troops had recently fought the U.S. in Korea, attempted to invade Taiwan, and were supporting North Vietnamese Communist troops in the Vietnam War. For a younger audience, this would be like if Kanye West offered to record an album with Pete Davidson after all that drama went down with Kim Kardashian. But Nixon and his national security advisor, later Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, hoped to exploit Sino-Soviet tensions. Their goal was to drive a wedge between China and the USSR. But in order to even meet with Mao, Nixon had to make some major concessions. First was America's unsolicited intervention in the growing Sino-Soviet dispute that saw Soviet forces deploying near the Chinese border in 1969. Nixon sent a clear message to Moscow that Washington would respond to any Soviet aggression against China. That's a pretty big deal considering at the time, Chinese forces were fighting the U.S. and Vietnam. For our younger viewers, this would be like if Kanye threatened anyone who messed with Pete Davidson while Pete was out on a date with Kim Kardashian. Now, President Nixon asked nothing in return for that security guarantee. And Mao certainly didn't offer anything. Not even an edible arrangement. Probably because all the farmers under Mao were starving to death. But there was another major concession. One that right now could be leading the U.S. into a war with China. I'll tell you what it is right after this short commercial break. Welcome back. In order for Nixon to make his historic trip to China, he had to make some major concessions to Chairman Mao. And there was one thing Mao wanted above all else, to send Chinese women to America. This is not a joke. Mao offered Kissinger 10 million Chinese women, not for him personally to send to America because there were too many of them in China. Apparently, he wouldn't shut up about it. He said there were too many women and too many kids. Well, the Communist Party was certainly able to solve that problem. But while Chairman Mao didn't want Chinese women, what he really wanted was Taiwan. At the time, Taiwan was still ruled by a military dictatorship led by Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang and the Kuomintang used to rule mainland China until his defeat by Mao's communist forces. But before his final defeat, Chiang fled to Taiwan, and Mao desperately wanted to deliver the final blow and seize control of Taiwan. The problem was, the U.S. was a strong supporter of Taiwan. In the 1950s, Mao attempted to invade Taiwan, twice. Those were called the First and Second cross Strait Crises. Both failed, in part due to U.S. intervention. Nixon himself was a personal friend of the then 83-year-old Chiang Kai-shek, whom Nixon fondly referred to as the old man. Wait, Nixon had a friend? That's surprising to hear, because even Nixon's dog seemed like it couldn't stand him. That dog looks like he's thinking, I roll around in the mud, and this guy's still somehow dirtier than me. However, China's premier, Zhou Enlai, tried to link U.S. recognition that Taiwan was a province of China as a precondition of Nixon's visit. In a phone call with Kissinger, Nixon said, the Taiwan thing, that's sort of worrisome. I don't know if there's a damn thing we can do about it, is there? Kissinger responded, 
It's a tragedy that it had to happen to Chiang at the end of his life, but we have to be cold about it. And Nixon's dog responded, this is why I hate you. In fact, the transcripts of Kissinger's first session with Zhou Enlai have Kissinger promising we have not and will not support any Taiwan independence movement. Now remember, at the time, Taiwan was not a democracy. Chiang Kai-shek ran a military dictatorship. And Chiang wanted to someday retake mainland China, which seemed pretty unlikely. Kissinger eventually got Premier Zhou Enlai to agree to the meeting by promising that U.S. recognition of Taiwan as a province of China was the ultimate direction of U.S. policy. In a memo to Nixon, Kissinger wrote, Joe accepted my position that some time would be required, i.e. well into your second term. But that never happened. Nixon's second term was cut short because of the Watergate scandal. That's right, Watergate saved Taiwan. Eventually, the U.S. would cut official diplomatic ties with Taiwan. That happened under Jimmy Carter in 1979. However, a Taiwan-friendly Congress passed the Taiwan Relations Act that ensured the U.S. would provide Taipei with defensive weapons, a move that infuriated Beijing. Because even Mao knew that a Chinese communist takeover of Taiwan would have to be bloody. He did not believe in a peaceful transition. Mao said, they're a bunch of counter-revolutionaries. How could they cooperate with us? Well. Maybe if you didn't starve your farmers, you could have let off with an edible arrangement. However, even though Nixon did not officially take the position that Taiwan was a province of China, Nixon did give Mao the most important thing. He ordered the Seventh Fleet out of the Taiwan Strait and the progressive withdrawal of U.S. forces from Taiwan. So what was the legacy of Nixon's trip to China? China continued its flow of arms, material, and some fighters in support of Hanoi's final conquest of South Vietnam and America's humiliating retreat. While Nixon wanted to play the China card against the Soviet Union, it can be argued that in reality, Beijing played an American card against the Soviet Union. For our younger audience, Mao essentially pulled a DJ Khalid on America. Congratulations, you just played yourself. It seems like eventually Nixon began to realize mistakes had been made. As early as his 1978 memoirs, Nixon wrote, We must cultivate China during the next few decades while it is still learning to develop its national strength and potential. Otherwise, we will one day be confronted with the most formidable enemy that has ever existed in the history of the world. According to Nixon's former speechwriter, before his death, Nixon feared the meeting may have changed the world for the worse. He was not as hopeful as he had once been. We may have created a Frankenstein. And, according to pedantic YouTube commenters, um, actually, Frankenstein was the doctor? No wonder you got caught, you idiot. As for Taiwan, Nixon concluded that history had passed unification by, and Taiwan's democratic course made it an incompatible marriage partner for Beijing. He said, the situation has changed dramatically. The separation is permanent politically. Like Kim and Kanye. Henry Kissinger, on the other hand, never wavered on the deal he and Nixon struck with Mao and Zhou Enlai. In fact, in a talk before the Asia Society in 2007, he warned Taipei to get on with its political accommodation with Beijing because China will not wait forever. And now it's time for me to answer a question from a fan who supports China Uncensored on the crowdfunding website Patreon or the exclusive social media platform Locals. Today's question comes from Min0119 on Locals. Could you make a detailed guide on what younger individuals can do to help fight China? I already boycott Chinese products and services. Avoiding Google is tough. But I was thinking career-wise. I'm a college student right now and feeling kind of puny and powerless. Could you, like, suggest which majors, career paths, hobbies I should take up if I want to help this cause? An excellent question. We are actually working on a guide for what people can do, but I'll give you the short of it. One of the biggest challenges facing U.S.-China policy is the fact that so many people were educated under the Kissinger philosophy on China. Engagement and appeasement. The idea that China will become democratic if we just keep pumping money into an authoritarian communist regime. That's like saying a grizzly bear will eventually become vegan if we just keep feeding them veal. That's how we got in this mess. So there's a real lack of politicians, diplomats, intelligence officers, 
think tank experts, academics, and so on, who really get the Chinese Communist Party. So since you're a college student right now, if you have the interest, I'd recommend China studies. Master the language, history, and culture, the culture of China, and the separate culture of the Communist Party. Become a China expert. That's how long-term you can really have an impact. Thanks for your question and your support. And thank you for watching. Join our exclusive social media platform on Locals. It's free to join, but for paying subscribers, you'll have access to even more perks, including the chance to have me answer your questions on the show. Head over to chinauncensored.locals.com to find out more. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.